Hello and welcome to the world today. I'm Millicent Walker. First, the headlines. UN chief Antonio Guterres says war in the 21st century is an absurdity as he visits sites around Kyiv that had been occupied by Russian troops. Sirens ring out in Israel to pay tribute to millions killed during the Holocaust. And Taiwan's daily COVID cases top 10,000 for the first time as residents rush to be vaccinated, while China sees a downward trend in COVID-19 cases. We begin with news from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs saying that other countries with similar circular with Ukraine have offered Nigerian students whose programs were interrupted by the Russia-Ukraine conflict admission to the ability to complete their studies either online or physically. Speaking at the 36th session of the State House briefing today, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, who led a delegation disclosed through its permanent secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Gabriel Aduda, who also said that Nigeria still maintains good diplomatic standing with Russia in spite of its condemnation of Russia's special military operation in Ukraine. According to him, all admission processing will be conducted through the Nigerian mission to authenticate students who were previously enrolled into various programs in Ukraine. A former president of the United Nations General Assembly, Tijani Mohamed Bande, further mentions that Nigeria is willing to accept educational opportunities from Russia because both countries are not at war and there is need to strategize a balancing act that is synonymous with diplomacy. And the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres is scheduled to meet the Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky today. On Tuesday, Mr. Guterres visited Moscow and held talks with the Russian President uh, Vladimir Putin. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres uh, today also toured Kyiv region towns of Borodyanka and Bucha that were shelled and occupied during Russia's offensive in northern Ukraine before it withdrew to focus on the east. He said civilians were paying the highest price in the war. According to him, the UN will continue the work to expand humanitarian support and secure the evacuation of civilians from conflict zones, urging for an end to hostilities. There is no way a war can be acceptable in the 21st century. Look at that. I imagine my family in one of those houses that is now destroyed and black. I see my, my granddaughters running away in panic, part of the family eventually killed. This horrific scenario demonstrates something that is unfortunately always true. The civilians always pay the highest price. Innocent civilians were living in these buildings they were paying the highest price for a war for which they had not contributed at all. Secretary General Jen Stoltenberg says the military alliance is ready to support Ukraine for years to come in the war against Russia. Speaking at a youth summit in Brussels, he said there is still absolutely the possibility that this war will drag on and last for months and years. NATO countries alongside countries that are not part of the alliance met in Ramsey in Germany earlier this week to discuss how they can support Ukraine's defense well, and security. Putin. The NATO chief said Ukraine's allies are preparing to provide it with NATO standard weapons. Ukraine, and we need to be prepared for the long term. Uh, Start with just... uh, so we will continue to put the maximum pressure on President Putin uh, to end the war by imposing sanctions, by providing economic support, but also military support to, to Ukraine. And we need to be prepared for the long term. Uh, it's a very unpredictable and fragile uh, uh, situation in uh, Ukraine, uh, but there is absolutely the possibility that this war will drag on and last for months and years. So NATO allies are preparing to provide support over a long period of time and also help Ukraine to, uh, uh, to, to transit uh, or, or move from old Soviet era equipment to more modern uh, NATO uh, standard uh, weapons and systems that will also require more training. You sell 
much, Mr. Secretary General. Thank you to all of you for your questions. Thank you for all the work you're leading. Thank you. Well, the U.S. president is at the moment outlining his plans to offer more support to Ukraine. He says he will ask Congress for $33 billion in military, economic and humanitarian assistance to support Ukraine for the next five months. The package includes more than $20 billion in military aid. $8.5 billion in economic aid and $3 billion in humanitarian aid. The White House has proposed giving the government greater part to seize and sell the assets of Russian oligarchs and transfer their proceeds to Ukraine. The legislative proposal will be presented to Congress for consideration. It follows similar legislation recently passed in the U.S. House of Representatives. But the new White House plans go further, focusing on collaboration between Justice, Treasury, State and Commerce Departments. The measures will make it easier for the U.S. to seize and sell oligarchs' assets and use the funds to remediate harms of Russian aggression. This is coming from the White House. Joining us now is human rights activist Olatunji Larry Barua, who joins me virtually. Thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you for having me, Minister. First off, uh, the UN chief is striving for cooling down tensions and peacefully resolving the Ukraine crisis, visiting uh, Russia Tuesday, and now he's in Kyiv. Uh, but is this working? My answer, unfortunately, would be no, even though I encourage this kind of um, intervention, uh, this high level intervention by um, high powered bodies like the United Nations. And we we'll also like to see other um, organizations, other countries like the United States being able to sit at the same table uh, with both uh, the Russian uh, president and the Ukrainian president to. Um, to resolve this crisis. But uh, the intervention is encouraged, it is welcome, it is very good, it is encouraging. But um, at the moment, whether this will uh, solve the problem, whether it will stop the shelling, stop the humanitarian crisis that is falling out of this, I'm not uh, very positive about that. But looking at how the United Nations has played its role, and this is in the past and perhaps this present war, uh, do you think there was something they could have done to forestall things uh, getting to this point, the aggression in Ukraine? Yeah, unfortunately, you know, the United Nations, you, we will all naturally feel that the United Nations is the most powerful multilateral body in the whole world and they should be able to rein in you know these kind of aggressive tendencies by you know powerful actors across the globe but unfortunately also uh, russia is a permanent member of the u.n security council with a veto power and that makes it pretty difficult for the united nations the united nations cannot function when the veto authorities within that body are becoming the aggressor, aggressors in conflict across the world. If you make move to sanction Russia, Russia will veto. If you make move to sanction the United States, the United States naturally will veto. If you make move to sanction China, even with what is happening in, um, you know, the, there's a, a region of China where there are Muslims, uh, you naturally expect that China will veto that. And if you have a veto at the UN Security Council, you can't move forward with those kind of actions. So the UN naturally should have been the ultimate body to solve this, but unfortunately, the UN is incapacitated in the way it is set up, and it cannot solve this kind of crisis. But also, you also have to look at the other side of the coin, that the Russian, if you look at the manner in which Russia assembled troops at the, at the border of Ukraine, you will know that it was fait accompli from the beginning. There was nothing that was going to stop Vladimir Putin from you know, sending troops into Ukraine. You don't just, the logistics of pulling 150,000 to 200 troops, 200,000 troops at the border of another country, combat troops, artillery troops, everybody, missiles are all there, everybody, the mechanized division, all of them were all lined up at the border of Ukraine. The logistics for doing that alone is expensive and it's cumbersome. And you don't just do that if you are fooling around. It was imminent. It was an attack. It was an invasion that was imminent. There was nothing anybody could have done to stop it. Russia was trying and going to make a statement. But how far they have gone, 
One, if they have achieved their ultimate goal, their initial objectives right now, I do not know, because this has also come with huge costs to the Russian military. Well, perhaps they really haven't, because they are warning with uh, outside interference into what they call their special um, military operation. operation. But we've seen, you know, an overwhelming majority of refugees as a result of this invasion. How would you say the rest of the world, especially the immediate community, which would be um, Europe, has reacted to this humanitarian crisis? It's been very positive, actually. Uh, the response from uh, Eastern European countries, the response from Poland, you know, I once uh, read out the statistics that in, uh, at the peak, at the peak of the uh, Syrian uh, conflict, uh, the total number of refugees that, you know, that emanated from that was just about 10% of what we had even within the very first month of, uh, uh, of of the Ukraine-Russian uh, crisis. So when you look at this, you see that it's, um, it is actually a very complicated one. Uh, Hungary, Moldova, uh, you find Bulgaria, you find Poland, they've been at the receiving end, receiving refugees, uh, you know, taking care of those refugees. How long this hospitality will be sustained is also, you know, one that comes with a question mark. Because even if you're willing, you will need resources to keep this going on. And I know that a lot of European countries have been coming together, releasing fund, mobilizing for fund to help uh, Ukrainian refugees in all these countries. But it's going to get to a point where you have to now look, it's going to be beyond even the host countries, even the psychosocial uh, problems that comes with this for refugees in itself, for displaced Ukrainians, for their children, for people who have lost livelihood, you know, not able to, students who can't go back to school, who have to now, you know, who are going to go through a whole round and lots of process to return to school, to find the source of living, is going to be really complicated. It is tough and it's going to get tougher as the weeks come by, as the months come by. This conflict doesn't look like it's going to end soon. The UN is saying that another Ukrainian child is becoming a refugee nearly every second and that more than one of every two Ukrainian children are now being displaced. Um, I believe my question is really how indeed they can be protected, seeing as uh, most of them have fled to some of these neighboring countries which you've mentioned, and they have been welcomed by governments and also by communities. But we also know the steps that Russia has taken in the, in the very recently, which is yesterday, uh, to Poland and Bulgaria. Do you see them... Um, what's the word now? Um, with regards to what they're doing to help those in Ukraine, do you see them, uh, do you see any concerns yeah. now in, you know, their actions towards uh, Ukrainians or those fleeing the war in Ukraine? Uh, you, you've talked about children, you've also talked about, you know, the, you know, actions the Russians are taking, which is also further exacerbating the crisis. The Ukrainian children will find it's going to be, it's going to be a very tough long journey for the children and you know you need a whole lot of care for kids at this level when you uh, when you have over over four million children have been displaced in ukraine at the moment and that's supposed to be more than half of ukrainian children and that is a very is a big problem when you look at children are usually the focus of development plans they had the future of every country when you cause displacement of these kids you displace them from school from their life you know everything is distorted for them now it's now like an arrested childhood for them but there's a whole lot that is going on i don't think that alone will solve the problem it depends on how far the countries that are hosting them are going to absorb them, you know, re-educate them, put them into the school. And I know certain parliaments or legislature in some countries are already passing law to absorb them, to give them easy passes so that some of them can get into school, their parents can find work and all that. So that's on one hand. But when you look at the action Russia is also taking further exacerbating the crisis, cutting off gas supply to Poland, to uh, Bulgaria, Russia is even trying to open a new frontier for this war in Moldova, in Transnistria, uh, or whatever. That particular strip around Moldova that borders Ukraine. So you find that this doesn't look like it's going to end soon. Now, you look at the statement issued by the Russian authorities earlier in the week, they wanted to also cut off the southern Ukraine. 
cut it off totally, cut Ukraine off from accessing, you know, the Black Sea. And that is going to be a whole lot of complication that you cannot find answers to right now. It's not going to end soon. The children are in for a long one. Their parents are even going to be in for more because parents can, you know, some parents are in their 40s, 50s. You can't restart your life. You have 10 years to retirement. You cannot, everything you have built and labeled for has been blown into shredding, into rubbles you know, by the bombing caused by Russia. How do you restart that? How do you rebuild that kind of life? How do you rebuild a house? How do you rebuild businesses? You can't even return into your country. That's complicated. The parents will never find their way back. They will never, they are not, I don't see them coming back from this. Some will come back, but the children still have long future ahead of them. So many of them will still thrive. So many of them just need the right mental and psychosocial support to thrive, to be reintegrated into society, to find jobs, to get education, and then launch themselves. And most of them will be the one that will ultimately rebuild Ukraine. Mm. And NATO is promising a sort of long-term support. We're also getting, um, you know, affirmations, and this is over this period, from the United States. Are you optimistic uh, with the kind of help and the packages, uh, the aid that they are providing at this time? You, you can't blame people who have attributed this as um, yeah, a prosy war between um, uh, Russia and the United States because the kind of funding, the kind of support, both military, you know, humanitarian that has come from the U.S. has been very significant. It's impressive. I'm particularly excited, especially about the humanitarian intervention. But when you also look at the, in, in the news, you read earlier, U.S. is providing about $20 billion worth of military support to Ukraine and the NATO countries. And that is to tell you that this is not going to end soon. They want to wear out and wear down the Russian army and then you, you see, if you imagine all the sanctions that come upon Russia, they cannot easily rebuild their military. So many of the components that they will need to rebuild, you know, military equipment are not going to be readily and easily available to them right now, except through China. And even that process is going to be complicated and cumbersome. So Russia will be able to, you know, hold its own in the short term. But rebuilding is going to be a problem for Russia if this if this conflict linger on for months or years to come. And the rest of the Western uh, nations are rallying around Ukraine. They are providing everything that is necessary to withstand the giants and the bullying of Russia in this particular instance. So it's, it is the way it is. And I know that um, the support will not stop coming. $20 billion is a lot of money. That's bigger than the Nigerian budget for the year. So you have to, you know, you should see that this is not going to end soon. Let's come back to Moldova and what we're seeing, especially what we've uh, seen in the past 24, 48 hours. Humanitarian workers there say they're working with partners to support refugees who are there. Uh, and we also know that they have tightened their security following the attack in uh, Tunisia, which isn't far off. What are the likely situation for refugees there, those who are making their way there from Ukraine? Uh, is this a time to leave or, or remain? Uh, it's double jeopardy. It's between the rock and the hard place. And I think right now, a lot of people will start moving because if you look at how this conflict started, Russia are massing troops at the border and saying, we are not going to invade. We are not going to invade. And then a Russian military uh, commander has said earlier in the week, they want to cut off Ukraine from the south, cut off the entire south and Ukraine, cut access of Ukraine to the Black Sea, meaning that they will not be able to. So once they create a corridor around there, it means Transnistria will also be part of, you know, the territory Russia is mapping out for seizure. So what it also means is there's going to be if likely, if possible, if needed, Russia will shell Moldova. Moldova has a total of about 6,000 um, um, soldiers in his military. I don't think they can, I don't think they can withstand the Russian. A Russian advance into Moldova will be a disaster. And as it stands today, refugees who are going in there will right now also be marking their way out of Moldova. And I know that humanitarian bodies, UNHCR, the Porsche, everybody, Oxfam, everybody right now will be working on how to create another pathway out of Moldova for these refugees, knowing fully well like there's an imminent crisis looming in the horizon. Russia may come from Moldova, and the moment that happens, it means another round of shelling double jeopardy for refugees, and that's, that's going to be very tragic, very tragic indeed.
We really hope it doesn't get to that as we continue to follow developments there. We would like to thank you, human rights activist Olari Olatunji Larry Barua. Thank you so much for joining us on the program. Anytime. Thank you for having me. Today is the Holocaust Remembrance Day, marking the anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. In Hebrew, Holocaust Remembrance Day is called Yom HaShua and is marked on a different day every year. And that's because when the actual date of Yom HaShua falls on a Friday, the State of Israel observes, observes it on the preceding Thursday. When it falls on a Sunday, Yom HaShoah is observed on the following Monday. Hence, this year, it is commemorated today. It's Holocaust Remembrance Day in Israel, and Israelis pulse to the sound of a lament and single tone siren across the country. Holocaust Remembrance Day commemorates the six million Jews killed by the Nazis during the Second World War. Prime Minister Naftali Bennett and President Isaac Herzog attended a wreath laying ceremony at Yad Vashem Holocaust Memorial Museum in Jerusalem. During the ceremony on Wednesday, Mr. Bennett said the most difficult wars today are not comparable to the Holocaust. <laughs> My brothers and sisters, the Holocaust is an unprecedented event in human history. I take the trouble to say this because, as the years go by, there's more and more discourse in the world that compares other difficult events to the Holocaust. But no, even the most difficult wars today are not the Holocaust and not comparable to the Holocaust. By Dover Jova Jevis was in her 20s when World War II started, and she was forced to leave Kyiv to escape the Nazis' invasion of Ukraine. At 100 years old now, she has had to flee Ukraine again, this time in the face of the Russian invaders. I have lived through two tragedies. I am twice a refugee. I was fleeing twice. I was fleeing from Hitler then. Now I have fled from Putin. Naturally, it is hard. I believe the humankind won't allow it. I believe humanity must learn something. In any case, I am expecting that all the Western countries won't allow all this. They'll put a stop to all this. Sort out that Putin. I hope for that. Otherwise, it is impossible to live with all that is happening. If somebody decides on the destinies of people, and it is absolutely not clear why. Jova Jevis is one of the almost 300 Jewish Holocaust survivors from Ukraine who have been given refuge in Israel since the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, ordered his troops into the former Soviet Republic two months ago. When the invasion started, she initially locked herself in her house all alone before deciding that she wanted to immigrate to Israel and stay there for the rest of her life, believing it to be the safest place for Jews to live. Becoming a refugee is especially hard for the elderly, who thought they would never have to confront war again. Some 161,400 Holocaust survivors and victims of anti-Semitism during the Nazi era live in Israel, in Tanya, north of Tel Aviv. Roman Haller's story is slightly different. He isn't sure exactly what day he was born, but believes it to be somewhere between May 7th and 9th in a bunker and a forest in 1944. Hannah's mother was pregnant when she and 11 other Jewish people were hidden by the Polish housekeeper of a Nazi family in their basement before being moved to a bunker when their hideout became too dangerous. Now aged 77, he lives in Munich, Germany, from where he calls on people not to forget the atrocities of World War II. Remembrance is so important so that what happened is never allowed to happen again. Never again, as we say. And in this respect, it is important to remember at least once a year what happened and how it came about. To fight against hate, hate is something. Everything starts with this hate. 
In the meantime, throughout today in Israel, television stations are devoting broadcasts to documentaries and interviews with survivors, and radio stations are playing solo music. And VOA's Linda Gratstein is in Jerusalem. She joins us now. Hi, Linda. Thanks for joining us. First off, what is the standard greeting for a day like this? Well, it's the same greeting as uh, any other day you would say shalom. Uh, but there definitely is a somber mood today. Earlier um, today, people across Israel stood still to commemorate the day. Speak to us about the significance of observing that moment when you leave everything to ponder for a few minutes or seconds. It, it's actually very dramatic. You know, on the major highways, the traffic just stops. On a bus, people stand up in the middle of the bus. Um, and it's a two-minute siren, and standing at attention for two minutes uh, is actually kind of a long time. And, you know, you definitely, almost everybody in Israel has some sort of family connection to the Holocaust. So, um, you know, to, to stop everything completely for two minutes um, on the highways, on the the, you know, the television, everything just stops and everybody stands at attention. It's almost like a, it's a little bit frightening in a way, but it, the fact that everybody is doing it at the same time, even little children from ages two or three are taught about this and taught that this is something that they should do. So this is what everybody does. Yes, everybody in the country. Um, you know, there's no law that says you have to do it, but it's certainly, uh, you know, and what people do in the privacy of their own home, obviously nobody knows, but certainly in public, uh, everything stops and people stand at attention and for two minutes think about the Holocaust. It happens again next week, by the way, on the uh, Memorial Day for uh, soldiers uh, who were killed in uh, Israeli wars. The same thing happens. Prime Minister Naftali Bennett spoke about hate and many Jews now having to escape Russia's invasion of Ukraine can relate to that even now. Ukrainians feel they are hated by Russians. What are some of the, the stories you've heard about what Israelis think of the war in Ukraine, some of whom once fled the country? Sure. So there, there's definitely the public sentiment seems to be on the side of the Ukrainian people. And there have been demonstrations in Israel saying that Israel should take in more refugees. So far, Israel's taken in about 15,000 refugees, several hundred of whom, as you said in the previous piece, are Holocaust survivors. Um, that said, uh, the state of Israel as a government has been trying to preserve some kind of neutrality uh, in order to keep good relationships with both Russia and Ukraine. Uh, in fact, the Prime Minister Naftali Bennett even visited Putin in Russia and offered to be a mediator between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, and the main reason for that is that uh, Russia controls the skies over Syria. And Israel has carried out hundreds of airstrikes against uh, Iranian arms making their way to Hezbollah. As those convoys go through Syria, Israel often bombs those convoys. And if there were tensions between Russia and Israel, Israel could lose its freedom of action in the skies. So Israel has not uh, provided Ukraine with any arms or anything like that. Uh, Israel has said that it will start providing flak jackets and helmets soon, but that hasn't happened yet either. Um, but there is a sense among the Israeli public, uh, especially those who have uh, had relatives who lost in the Holocaust or who are survivors themselves, that Israel should be doing more to help Ukrainian refugees. And Linda, what kinds of programs, um, events are, are planned for a day like today? Well, there's, um, there's probably thousands of ceremonies. I mean, there's a national ceremony at Yad Vashem, which is Israel's uh, uh, Holocaust memorial. Uh, but yet, and in addition, every school has a ceremony. Every youth group has a ceremony. Every synagogue has a cer ceremony. My own uh, synagogue last night had a program in which a 105-year-old woman uh, who had survived the Holocaust spoke about her experiences. So it's, you know, it's not a, a vacation day. Everybody goes to work or to school, uh, but there are thousands of ceremonies and, and uh, commemorations across the country. In memory, we'd like to thank you, uh, Linda and Shalom. Thanks for joining us on the program. Thank you. Thank you. 
Twitter says it has established what it calls a legal entity in Nigeria months after it agreed to conditions set by the Nigerian federal government for its service to be restored in the country. The federal government suspended the microblogging site June last year following a tweet by the president referencing the civil war was deleted. The government accused the company of taking sides. However, seven months after the ban was lifted when Twitter agreed to various conditions, one of which was that it registers in Nigeria before the month of March this year. According to the BBC, a Twitter representative confirms the company now has legal presence in Nigeria, but did not state when this had happened. We're joining, in me, joining me now to talk more about this is an IT and cybersecurity expert, Adidomi Adidiji. He joins us from Lagos. Thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you very much for having me. Now, Twitter says it now has legal presence in Nigeria. What exactly does that mean? Um, well, um, a business having a legal representation means uh, they are registered in Nigeria under um, CAC. And um, what that means is um, they have some form of official registration as um, a business entity um, working in Nigeria. So it uh, doesn't necessarily mean that they already set up an office, but officially uh, they are registered in Nigeria, probably as maybe Twitter in Nigeria or uh, some other entity. And um, majorly it's registering under the government as a business that is operating in Nigeria. Because for a lot of tech companies that run, uh, they run online, so they don't have to, most of the time, they don't have to register uh, based on the law of uh, different countries. They don't have to register in the country because, I mean, it can, the service can be accessed almost anywhere. So uh, for some countries, um, you are not, you are not um, entitled to register as an entity in the country, even if the citizens of that country are using the service. Um, however, um, but over the years, some things are changing. And uh, governments are now requiring that some of these um, entities register in the country. And uh, that's one of the steps Nigeria is taking. Uh, because in, um, in 2020, we had the digital tax law, uh, meaning that uh, companies that run digital services in Nigeria um, have to pay some form of tax to the government. So um, for you to pay tax in, the, um, in Nigeria, you have to be a registered entity in the country. So uh, I think that's what uh, Twitter has, has done so far. And... Um, we are seeing now. But many people wonder about the physical presence, pretty much like Ghana, you know, office in, you know, Nigeria. Um, but even with that, do you think that Twitter has also been monitoring tweets out of Nigeria to ensure that they meet the federal government's conditions in line with this sort of legal presence which we're hearing they have? Uh, well, uh, most of the time, um, in 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 monitoring tweets, uh, I won't say I won't say yes uh, that they've been monitoring tweets. Of course, there are always internal processes uh, for a huge uh, social media platform like that. There are always uh, processes for uh, them to analyze and uh, look at various chunks of data that come into their system from time to time. Um, however, uh, there are standard um, procedures for certain things. Now, sometimes uh, their system or their algorithm can pick up certain contents and flag it for review. Uh, sometimes some of these contents can be reported to uh, Twitter that look look at this content. Some of these contents can be flagged by regular other Twitter users that this content is inappropriate. And it goes through uh, the Twitter's internal uh, content management uh, platform to see if it's something they would allow or they would remove or they'll put some form of notice on it that uh, maybe this information is inaccurate or is not correct or something. So um, I won't entirely say the monitor because I mean there are billions of tweets that <laughs> uh, I mean millions of tweets that go out every time. However, some of these things can be flagged based on keywords, uh, based on um, artificial intelligence systems that can scan through pictures or videos for anything sensitive, and uh, some of these things can be flagged. But ultimately, um, I think. The content management system is what uh, we should talk about, meaning that how is Twitter managing their space uh, to avoid uh, misinformation and um, some of the uh, pitfalls we've seen over the last few years when it comes to social media. So yes, uh, there will be, definitely be some form of monitoring, but I don't think it's specific to Nigeria. I think it's a general thing um, across the world. Uh, some of these things do happen, so I don't think it's specific to Nigeria.
And I don't know, I mean, there's been mixed feelings now. Elon Musk is set to take over the company. Do you think that that will have any impact on Twitter in Nigeria? Uh, in the mid days, no, I don't think there will be um, any major uh, difference. Uh, however, in the long term, um, one of the key reasons why Elon Musk is or uh, chose to buy Twitter is the fact that he wants to um, he wants to promote um, freedom of um, expression. Uh, but then uh, the question we should always ask is um, how free should freedom of information be? Or freedom of expression be so if you are free to express yourself how far can you go uh, and i think these are some of the that's where we need to find a balance yes you are free to um you are free to express yourself uh, but then where do we put a full stop to that i think these are some of the things that a lot of people are worried about um, because uh, several accounts that probably were taken offline or were blocked by twitter over the years were probably accounts that uh, Twitter as a management felt that they were tweeting things that were not right or they were tweeting uh, misinformation or disinformation and or they were running campaigns that were uh, misinforming people and they had to take them off of uh, the platform. So uh, some, there are some fears that some of these accounts might come back. So, uh, but then the argument is let everybody have their say and let people choose the side they want to be on. Uh, but then we also know that uh, there's no, all these things are not black and white. They still have to do some level of regulations in that regard. And um, one of the few um, regions that we've seen that has been outspoken about this is the EU. Uh, the EU has clearly said that even though Elon Musk is buying Twitter, that he has to be aware that uh, the EU have um, information laws which has to be enforced. So uh, we'll see how that goes. Mm. And also, he hasn't taken over yet, but, um, you know, he's said to be already breaching the agreement with a disparaging tweet about a Twitter employee. Uh, do you think he can pull through this deal? And if Twitter is already flagging this, could he pull out of the deal? Uh, well, it's, it's still hard to say, uh, because um, for if, for those that know Elon Musk's uh, personality, he's someone that gets what he wants, <laughs> so that's one of his biggest strengths. Um, however, um, this is one case where we can't really see where the dice will roll, in the sense that, yes, um, he has the money to buy this, but there are other interests at play also uh, in this in this in this scenario. So um, we'll see how it goes. But nevertheless, what I would definitely say is that uh, some of the interests that are not in line with Milo um, Mux buying the system would also put up a fight against this. So um, we can't really say how this will go down yet. And his own actions, his own management style also is also a threat to the deal. And uh, like you rightly said, uh, some of his tweets has uh, raised a bit of concern already. Uh, just a few days into this whole deal, uh, some of his recent tweets have raised uh, suspicion and uh, questions about whether I should own it. Uh, but on a personal level, I would say that um, I think Twitter is a huge platform that should not be a private uh, property. Uh, property. Uh, for one person. Uh, it should be something that um, should have a board, uh, as it currently has, and um, we should be able to have dialogue on how what should be the way forward uh, for Twitter. Uh, so by taking it private, I feel it's a bit extreme, and I feel that it's not the right move, uh, move for a platform as powerful as Twitter. So uh, hopefully, uh, there will be a middle ground, even if it buys it, um, I feel that uh, there might need to be some check and balances uh, that would have to be put in place to avoid um, a case where he has the overriding uh, decision over everything that happens in Twitter. So I truly believe that there will be some form of management in place uh, that can help make decisions um, alongside with um, Elon Musk. All right, IT and cybersecurity experts, Adedoyi Adedeji, many thanks for joining us on the program. Thank you very much for having me. A 14-member Chinese expedition team is performing a task of setting up eight automatic meteorological stations at extremely high altitudes on a mountain in the southwest China's Tibet Autonomous Region, one of which will set world record in terms of the altitude. The 14 mountaineers a week ago set up an automatic meteorological station at an altitude of 7,790 meters under extreme conditions of strong winds and thin air, setting a 
national record for a meteorological facility at such an altitude. And six hours later, they installed another same type automatic station at an altitude of 8,300 meters by working in a temperature of minus 20 degrees Celsius, renewing its own record. The eight automatic meteorological stations with different gradients mainly monitor the variations in parameters of temperature, humidity, wind direction and speed, atmospheric pressure, radiation and the Mount Wilmalangma region and also realize remote real-time data transmission. And a Russian pilot who returned to Moscow from the United States as part of a prisoner swap has said today that he had been tortured in custody in Liberia before his extradition to America and beaten in a U.S. military base. Konstantin Yaroshenko was arrested by U.S. Special Forces in Liberia in 2010 and convicted for conspiracy to smuggle cocaine into the U.S. He was serving a 20-year sentence. He was released Wednesday in exchange for former U.S. U.S. Marine Trevor Reed was convicted in Russia in 2019 of endangering the lives of two police officers while drunk on a visit to Moscow. Flanked by his wife and daughter in the television studio of Russian media, uh, he said he was told to sit on a chair with his arms shackled and beaten for three days. Yeroshenko said he tried to glean information about the world from the 15 minutes a day of television he was allowed to watch. Meanwhile, the parents of former Marine um, Trevor Reed, who was released in exchange for the Russian pilots, uh, Yeroshenko, have expressed their joy and relief at their son's return home. The swap was not part of broader diplomatic talks and did not represent an American ex uh, change in approach to Ukraine. Uh, this is coming from U.S. officials. Russian-American ties have been at their worst since the Cold War era, following Russia's February 24 invasion of Ukraine and subsequent West and sanctions imposed in Moscow. His mother, Paula Reed, said she was moved to tears when seeing him on television as her son looked frill and unrecognizable. Joey and Paula Reed, the parents of Trevor Reed, thanked President Biden and others, saying in a statement that the president's action may have saved Trevor's life. She was sitting on the couch and I was sitting on a chair, so I couldn't see her face, but I know I was crying when I, I, I was kind of, I'd seen it. I was talking to someone and kind of saw it out of the corner of my eye earlier, but when they started showing it again, I looked at it and I went, oh my gosh, because like I said, it looked like he was hunched over and he was kind of, kind of walking like this and they grabbed his bag and then they were helping him get up in the plane. Um, he, looked, he looked very frail and, um... The, and immediately, like Joey said, you know, I, I immediately tears just came to my face because it just, he just didn't look like himself. And um, that's a really hard thing to see, you know. And we're, like I said, because he's used so healthy normally. Residents of Taiwan are rushing off to get their COVID-19 booster shots as the country reports that its daily number of confirmed domestic cases had topped 10,000 for the first time in line with predictions. During his daily brief in Taiwan's health minister, Chen Shi chung who had previously predicted 10,000 daily cases by the end of the month, reported 11,353 daily confirmed cases and said Taiwan was still on the phase where infections would keep rising. Despite the surge in the number of cases, residents in the capital, Taipei, are not overly concerned, as the country is in much better position than during a similar outbreak a year ago, including having a high vaccination rate. Meanwhile, China's biggest COVID-19 outbreak in Shanghai has again raised questions about the country's official data, especially a death rate that, despite a recent jump, remains far lower than elsewhere. Shanghai had reported no COVID-19 deaths for more than a month after the current outbreak began in early March, but deaths suddenly started to creep up over the past 11 days. The city of 25 million people has now reported 285 COVID-related fatalities since April 17 and around 500,000 confirmed cases. Meanwhile, several studies have cast doubt on China's numbers, with one released in June uh, saying that uh, they fall outside June 2020, that is, that they fall outside of recognized and accepted medical norms. It estimated that 36,000 people could have died in Wuhan alone, 
more than 10 times the official figure. Because uh, lockdown, the one consequence is like you don't know your neighbor, right? You know, they may die in their apartment. You have no idea at all. So that's, uh, that happened in Wuhan that way too. You know, everything else, it, you know, without the you know, transparency, everything else is just a guess. It's a, it's a reasonable guess. It's an educated guess, but still guess. <laughs> no confirmation. <laughs> Away from the pandemic and back in Europe, Britain and the European Union are set to be at an impasse over changes to parts of the Brexit deal governing trade with Northern Ireland. Both sides have been trying for months to overcome a deadlock of the Northern Ireland Protocol, which sets the trading rules for the British region that London agreed before it left the EU, but now says are unworkable. Britain's EU withdrawal pact effectively left Northern Ireland within the EU single market and customs union given its open border with EU member Ireland, though in so doing raised some barriers to trade between Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom. About how we protect the good farm paper. We have, we have made progress. I think it's, it's important to say that, that we have made progress. I think the Foreign Secretary and Vice President Sefcovic um, enjoy a good professional working relationship. Um, and you know, we 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 do we do feel that um, uh, Mr. Sefcovic and, and his team come with a, a desire to to resolve this issue. Um, the truth is that we have uh, come to something of an impasse, um, and I don't think that's through a lack of goodwill. I think it's more through a uh, what we regard in the UK as an overly limited negotiation negotiating mandate that Mr Sefcovic and his team have got the last one you, you can't and here's one for all lovers of our furried friends. After they have had a long day of walking and playing fetch, which can be tiring, believe me, you can help them unwind by taking them to Dubai's first dog dining establishment, who says dogs don't want to be treated right. Oh, they do. And they are treated right at Happy Bark Day. No, that's just the name of the establishment. Happy Bark Day it exclusively serves dogs and cats with a menu full of health a human grade meals designed by its founder Yon Su Koo. Koo, who moved to Dubai back in 2008 from South Korea, decided to get her pet's nutrition yeah. certificate after her first dog, Mom, fell ill. So she began preparing treats using fresh, high quality ingredients, tailoring the contents to her friends' dogs who had special dietary requirements. Now she serves a rotating menu of treats prepared every day with items like puppuccinos made using a slow broth of oxtail or chicken and pop cakes made with beef and salmon combined with vegetables or even tiered trays of treats for afternoon tea. Oh, and meals at Happy Bark Day cost between $10 to $20 with cakes made especially for dogs' birthdays costing around $55. Well, there you have it. That's it on the world today. Thank you for watching. I'm Melissa Walker. Have a good evening.